Good morning. We're going to get started. It's 8.30. We've got a really tight agenda, and we'd like to try to, to keep to it. So good morning. I hope everyone had a great day yesterday, and um, excited to see you all here. Uh, just before we get started, I did hear that it was a little difficult for some folks in the back to hear some of the speakers, especially the ones that have a little lower voices I tend to project. Um, so if there are um, any folks in the back that are having difficulty hearing, just let somebody know up here so we can try to adjust the mics, because it would be good if everybody can, can... Right, well, I hope they can hear me back there. So if there's any problem, either move up to the front, we've got some seats up here, or just let somebody know, we'll do our best to, to adjust the mics. So um, today's plenary, we are going to review the roadmap and do some demonstrations of the website, acquisitions, e-holdings, inventory, and codex, check-in, check-out, and loans demo. So you can actually see working code as long as the internet is up and running, and uh, it's, going to be, it's going to be real fun. And tomorrow, again, we're going to do some lightning rounds of demonstrations. So these plenaries are going to be uh, live and coming straight from the code. Uh, but before we get started, I have the distinct pleasure to present some community awards, some recognition uh, on behalf of the Folio community nominated by this community and your peers. We would like to recognize a few folks here. Um, these awards are given in recognition of exemplary contributions, model community behavior, and dedication to our shared effort. There are many people deserving of recognition and thanks for your daily contributions and concessions required by this project. You all set a high bar for the extraordinary. To that end, these recognition awards are given by the community to recognize excellence among our own colleagues. And so when I call your name, if you would just stand up, we'd just like to give you a round of applause. And, and these are in no particular order. And yes. Oh, we're gonna have them come up? Okay, we'll have you come up. We'll have you come up and, and take a little award. Uh, Anne Highsmith. Please come on up. Jason Skomorowski. Holly Misselbauer. Paula Sullinger. Andrea Logman. Lynn Wittenberger. Charlotte Witt, oh. Kristen Martin, Zach Burke, Mikhail Kulis, Peter Murray, Kirsten Kemner Heek, Laura Wright, Christy Thomas, Lisa McColl. Sharon Wiles Young, Kate Boram, Patrick Zinn, and Rachel Fadlin. Thank you very much. Yes? Okay. Kate, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kate Borma. I'm the lead product owner on Folio. And today, um, Jakob, Mark, Harry, and I are going to talk to you a bit about um, Folio status and planning. So I'm going to kick it off and then hand it over. But um, basically, we're going to cover some of our accomplishments um, from the beginning of the year. Then we're going to talk about um, the planning and pre-work and process that we use to gather the information we needed for the planning, which Mark and Harry will then talk about. All right, so I'm going to kick off and just um, 
covers some of the UI accomplishments since Madrid. Yeah, but then, all right. We'll switch it up. Hello, am I coming through? Okay, that seems to work. All right, I'll be very quick. So, uh, a quick update. Um, in Madrid, we've met and we had a new installation called Folio Alpha with uh, all new tools, including uh, codec search and initial version of inventory. Uh, and that was the focus of that demo and, and that, that milestone release to uh, show integration across KB and, um, and um, uh, inventory. So since Madrid, uh, we've been working on a couple of different things. There's not been a focus on a single thing like we had uh, for Madrid. Uh, so I'll just very quickly give you an update for, um, about the new stuff that has been developed. Uh, Okapi, the biggest thing is probably the new Okapi client, um, uh, command line client that is supposed to ease some of the DevOps uh, tasks. It will be discussed tomorrow, so anybody who's interested, I, um, I would like you, I invite you to, to join that um, uh, session. Um, and I'll just move on because we have very little time. Uh, circulation module, the most interesting uh, um, new development is probably the new checkout and re renewal API. Um, for some of you guys that have been working with the codes, you might remember that it's been a uh, rather complex process to renew uh, and check out items. It involved um, a lengthy conversation with the, with the web service to do this. Now it's a streamlined process with a single uh, simple uh, API, and we're really hoping that this is going to um, fill the needs for integration with external protocols, but also uh, simplify and um, optimize the, the checkout operation in the UI. Uh, internationalization, so that was one of the themes um, uh, before uh, meeting here. Uh, support in the front end was very basic, that's been extended to allow formatting messages. Um, uh, there's been some work on a tool to integrate with that. I think Kate's gonna cover that. Uh, and there's been also support for time zones, so rendering um, and formatting dates in the UI according to the time zone selected. Uh, new module uh, for tagging, so a central um, a separate module for storing tags, managing those tags, um, and support uh, on the schema level and implementation uh, level for external modules. We've so far enabled that for users, which is maybe not the most exciting module uh, where people would like to see tagging, but that's the, that's the proof of concept work, and we've been rolling that support over to other module, modules um, after this meeting. Um, quick update on, 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 the, on the Folio uh, DevOps uh, work. Uh, Folio snapshot stable, that's the installation now we have uh, fully uh, moved all the testers to. Uh, so that's the stable installation where all the latest but stable codes can be seen, uh, can be reviewed, uh, and can be sort of, you know, experienced. Um, the, the new development that happens is also integrating our UI testing regression uh, uh, test suite with pull requests. So um, for a long time we had uh, uh, developers running the test suite locally, updating tests, hopefully, uh, uh, to work with the new codes. Now this is going to be enforced by the CI, so this is a really um, uh, um, promising change. And just a note that this will be discussed also on one of the sessions today, so uh, please join us if you'd like to hear more about this. Um, and some proof of concept work. So you've seen the workflow engine that's been presented yesterday by Zaf. Um, uh, so that's very exciting work. Uh, also, there's been some work by the, the, the UI guys uh, to migrate one of the application as a proof of concept uh, to use GraphQL. GraphQL is a um, different way of retrieving data from the back end to the front end, more sort of sophisticated and exciting, and we'll have a session on that too. So, um, so please join us if you're interested. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kate. All right. 
Um, thanks. Yeah, so a ton of work on the platform and back end, and I just wanted to summarize some of the work that we've been doing on the front end, um, and this is across all of the teams. Um, so the UNAM team in Mexico has made great progress. They've um, wrapped up the fee-fine configuration tables, um, and they've done a lot of work on the fee-fine lists and fee-fine details. We just need to get their code now merged into master so we can see it in our environments. Um, there's been some uh, improvements to the check-in app. Um, the core team has made, we now have um, basically all the data that we would like to see on the check-in screen and also the ability to backdate check-ins. Uh, requests, there's been a lot of progress in that area as well. We have the ability to request as proxy now. Um, we have a request status to track the requests through their life cycle. And we've also refactored the app so that it uses the uh, search and sort smart component um, that's basically used in all of the apps um, that have that kind of layout and folio. Um, for loans, we've got uh, loan data on the item record now. Um, this is new, and we've also made some refinements to the loan list um, and the loan detail records to pull in additional data and just make sure that the UX is um, in sync with uh, the patterns that we're using elsewhere in Folio. Um, we've been doing a lot of work, Yaka mentioned, um, basically to hook up our loan policies to the loans themselves. So um, we've long had a loan policy form where you could set things like loan period, um, is it a you know, fixed versus rolling, um, the ability to you know, truncate due dates uh, based on fixed due date schedules and things like that. And we're, we're just sort of every sprint we are adding stories to hook those things together so that when you actually do check check out an item in Folio, these, um, these settings govern your checkout. Um, just recently, we've made, um, we've, we've uh, implemented both locations and service points. So these are really important foundational elements to Folio. Um, we will talk about them in more detail um, later on. As with all of these things, you'll see demos and, and talks on, on basically everything I cover here. Um, but yeah, we have the ability to, um, to, to capture location hierarchy and to create service points. There's more work to be done there, but um, it's a really good start. Um, the Kulto guys in uh, Hungary have um, implemented a basic calendar app for us. We had a good meeting yesterday on the future of that app. There's um, plenty of work to do still, um, but we've got something there that we can actually use um, for um, starting to, to hook into our, our loan rules. Uh, for the acquisitions folks, um, Stacks, um, they've been continuing work on vendors. We've got sort and filter. Um, they've got a UI for finances now. Um, and in the area of e-holdings, there's been a lot going on. Some um, highlights, uh, package records have been enhanced. We've got custom coverage, show hide flag. Um, and uh, the area of inventory, um, we have the ability to clone holdings and items, um, add and validate inventory data elements. Um, and then, of course, we've had a, um, a proof of concept for the data lake, which was created by the EBSCO um, team. So really a ton of work, if you think about it, um, just since the beginning of this year. So I think uh, maybe we should just take a minute to give ourselves a hand. <laughs> All right, so those are the accomplishments. And uh, before I hand it over to Mark to talk about the actual planning and, and sort of the, the future, um, I just wanted to uh, just give a little description of the process that we use to gather the information that was needed for planning. Um, so step one, um, we took the line items from the V1 roadmap, um, the spreadsheet that was created by Harry and all of the SIGs. Um, and we uh, migrated them into JIRA. So we have a project in JIRA called UX Prod, um, and all of these um, line items are now in JIRA in UX Prod, and they've been created as epics. Um, we then decomposed those epics into features, um, and this was done by the product owners. Um, they took the first pass, and they did this based on you know, their understanding of what these things really were about um, from their conversations with the SIGs. They looked at all the shared documents on the Google Drives that had been created. They looked at the parking lots that had been generated, and they created epics, uh, or sorry, features for each epic, which were then validated with the SIGs and subgroups. Um, so basically, the hierarchy we are using in JIRA is you know, epics 
are the most high level. They map to the V1 roadmap document. Those are decomposed into features, and then features are decomposed into stories, which are what are delivered to the development teams um, and have you know, all the details they need for that development increment. So once we had all those features, we exported them into Excel, um, and we estimated every single one of them with the developers. It was a huge effort um, uh, for both the developers and the product owners to kind of go through each one. Um, we sort of t-shirt sized them here. You can see um, the, the sizing that we used. Um, so every feature and also every uh, user story that was still in progress or not started. And then finally, um, we went back to the, the SIGs and subgroups just to make sure that we understood the priorities of those features so that then we could um, think about how we wanted to start phasing our betas. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as I was coming up, to, my name is Mark Wexler, um, in case you don't know me. As I was coming up to the podium, I was thinking that I will greet everyone in their native language using the languages that are represented here in this room. And then I started counting how many languages are there. And I quickly ran out of fingers. So um, care to guess how many languages are represented here? So there are 16, 16 different languages. Isn't that amazing? So I, I figured that I'll just do the greeting in the uh, four languages that I'm recently Reason, reasonably fluent in. So the first one is uh, good morning, um, it's American English. Good morning, that's Canadian English. <laughs> good, good morning, that's uh, Australian English. And uh, good morning, that's British English. <laughs> so um, uh, based on the work that uh, Kate and the team and the developers did, uh, we then started to uh, pulling the numbers together in order to uh, figure out what is the remaining effort, when can we reasonably uh, start releasing version one, whatever version one is uh, called. And using this analysis, using the analysis of uh, what are the remaining features, how long does it take to implement it, we should look at the uh, existing staffing and decide, uh, well, are there any uh, glaring shortages in, uh, in uh, different uh, skill sets that uh, we have. Um, so we collected these numbers, um, reviewed the uh, current uh, capacity, applied the extremely sophisticated algorithm to this, and uh, identified uh, gaps in uh, multiple areas. And um, so this is represented in uh, the spreadsheet. So on the left-hand side, we have different projects. Uh, in uh, different columns, we have the uh, level of effort from uh, different teams. And very quickly, we saw that uh, there are certain areas that need attention. And many of you would probably be able to guess without even going through that analysis that uh, there are you know, big shortages in the uh, backend development. And what we also discovered is that we're not given enough priority to addressing non-functional requirements. And uh, we need to start escalating these to the level of uh, functional work. Non-functional requirements, also known as NFRs, are uh, things like uh, performance testing, um, DevOps type, type of work, and, uh, and so on. So by the way, this describes the difference between front-end developers and back-end developers, in case uh, people have questions. Um, and so based on this, um, um, we um, need to rebalance the work, and uh, you know, we're suggesting that uh, we probably want to have some intermediate milestones. We want to have uh, different releases um, that would allow us to stay focused. For each release, we may uh, adjust the uh, scope. We would know what the uh, staffing levels are so that we can fit the work uh, uh, for, uh, for those resources. And, um, sprinkle um, these uh, releases between now and uh, V1. And so these releases, you know, we're arbitrarily calling beta one, beta two, beta three, beta four, and so on. And um, so Harry will talk about the next steps. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. So next steps. Um, yikes. I'm going to keep this really simple. I just have a single slide, which is rare for me. Yes. <laughs> all right. So uh, based on all the work from Kate, Jakob, um, Mark as well, uh, we were able to pull all of this together and really review and discuss at both the stakeholder meeting and also the PC meeting as well at this conference. And it really just boils down to really what are our next steps in terms of how we drive this forward? How do we prioritize? And so one of our initial goals here is we have a very good sized group of what amounts to early adopters for Folio. And as we think about these priorities, a lot of these priorities need to align with how do we get libraries up and running, especially how do we get these early adopters up and running? And so one of the first things we're going to be doing coming out of this meeting, and maybe even ideally at this meeting, is really building out that timeline or schedule of who these early adopters are, when they intend to go live, and then based on that, start to conduct a gap analysis of what are those key features that they actually need to get their libraries up and running on Folio? And then ideally, once we have that list, go back to the PC so we can review and adjust and prioritize to accommodate as many of these features and functionality pieces as possible. And really, from there, in addition to adjusting these as priorities, taking a look at its scope, timeline, how much work, how much effort is needed, what are the estimates for all of this work. And so we can really start to make some key decisions as to what has to be done. And so we will start to work on that over the next few weeks. Um, in addition, uh, we can take all of that and looking at the institutions that plan to migrate and start to work out what is an overall migration plan that we can start to tackle not only who comes first, what features or keys, what migration tools do we need to start looking at in terms of what we need to build, for example, based on what are the first ILS systems that we're going to be migrating from, what are the types of data that we need, what are the tools that we need to actually make this happen. And then ultimately, looking across the project as a whole, now that we've got these priorities, start to align everyone and resources. So we're all working and aiming at the exact same target, meaning not just developers, not just product owners, but UI designers as well, um, the SIGs as well, everyone collectively. Let's get together, let's align, and let's execute, and let's hit our goals, and let's get these libraries up and running. And that's it. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Rachel Fadlon. I'm the convener of the Community Outreach SIG. While I was practicing this at home, my daughter told me that I sounded like a boring business person, so I'm going to try to lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be able to demo the, web, the new folio.org website. Uh, before I start, I just want to tell you what the three goals were of the new website. The first was to create a user-friendly site that's easy to find information and to connect to other communication channels. The second was to be very clear how everyone in the community can get involved in the project. And the third goal was to provide concrete information on the platform, which was lacking on the old site because when we built the site, there wasn't any. Um, I'm gonna just leave this here. Okay, without further ado, I'm gonna show you some of the features of the new site. And I just want to point out again that this is a demo, so it doesn't have full functionality yet, but I wanted to just be able to point out some highlights of the site to everyone. 
As you can see from the top, the blue line is a nav bar that's going to be a unified navigation bar across all of our communication channels. So that way, it won't matter whether you're in a dev site, whether you're in dev.folio.org, whether you're in GitHub, on the wiki, or in Jira, or anywhere else within any site, you can, get, you can see where you are within Folio, and you can get to the other communication channels seamlessly and back to the website. Um, you may have noticed that this has already started kind of a soft rollout on some of the sites. Thank you to Peter Murray for working on that. Um, so it, it, it is already up on a few of the sites, and that's why, and that's what's going on. I just want to show you what the home page looks like right now. So at the top here, you've got, we've got a slide deck which will enable us to show kind of the real things that are happening right now within the project. So we'll, have, we'll, we'll always open up with an overview, we have capability, we're, we're in Durham, so obviously we've got to do video up there um, to show, to highlight videos around the project and to do some in-depth community user stories. This is, this is from, this is Chris Manley's article that he did a while ago from Cornell. That's up there being featured right now. And it'll take you directly to the UX prototype so you can actually get in and see what's going on and see what it looks like straight away when you get into the site. How am I doing? Am I too business, businessy? Am I sounding boring? <laughs> this is something new that we've got on the homepage that I'm really excited about um, in terms of making it very clear who's involved in the project and how to get involved. Whether you're a librarian, a developer, or a vendor, you can click straight here and get into your own personalized section that kind of walks it through as one of those people how you can relate to the project and get involved. And I'll, I'll dive into those in a second. We're also going to have a lot more up-to-date information. We have a completely new news section that I'll show, that I'll show you all um, that is kind of like our press page, so we can feature news and press releases on one page. And these will have our Twitter feed and our events, which will link out to our Twitter page and to our public events calendar, which is on Trello. And then we just very easily down here make, make it easy for people if they want to get our community updates. If you all don't do that on folio.org right now, please feel free to register it to get our twice a month we have community updates if you're not already receiving those. All right, there are a few things that I want to show within here. Come on. Oh, I know why. Sorry. This is a demo. Bear with me. I have to be from here to get in here. There we go. OK. Um, so I'm going to just show you what, what some of these pages look like. So if you're a librarian and you click on, on the librarian link, it will have tabs that are specifically related to different channels within the community that are relevant to you. Um, I don't think a lot of librarians typically hang out on Slack, uh, so we didn't put it in here. But we did put a lot of the channels where you find librarians hanging out, congregating, asking questions, getting involved, especially the wiki, which was why we put that first. So that's, that's where all the librarians are hanging out as, as subject matter experts. Um, and then, obviously, you can click through the rest of the tabs as well. I'm just going to go back and show you what, what those other communities look like as well. Let's see if I can click in through here. Sorry, it's a little messy. And the say, I, I'm very excited that we now feature a developer section on our, on our site, too. Uh, and obviously, Slack is, Slack is on this tab. So, so we've got more of the technical, the technical spaces in the community where our developers hang out and what they can do and ways to get involved as well. And I have to click back here. This is going to be much more user-friendly when it's the real website, I promise. And something completely new is that we're all, we also have a space for vendors. We, we always say that we want vendors to join and be part of the project, but hadn't really highlighted ways that they could be a part of the project or be involved. So here we've actually laid out for four vendors coming to check out the site. Here are some things, here are some ways that you could contribute to the project. You could host, you know, offer hosting and maintenance, serv maintenance services. You could build an app. You could add a knowledge base. And then also how to become more involved in the community. And, be mentioned, which is what I'm going to highlight last because I think it is the coolest page that we've added, how to be mentioned as part of our community. Okay, let me head back. I want to show you a few things under our About section, which are new. 
We now have, as I was showing you lower down, we have a news and events section that we never had before. We have a new gorgeous resources page and we have a blog post. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna show you what the blog page looks like, but it's gonna be a page just featuring all the blogs, whereas now it's a mess of news and blogs. We've separated them out to make it much clearer on the new site. I'm just gonna show you our news and events page because I think it's beautiful. I think it looks a lot fancier than what we've got now. So, this, so up top of our news page, we'll have the three upcoming events that are, that are coming in the community, and then there will be a link out to all of the events uh, to our Trello page, and then it'll just be a whole page of all of our news. I also want to mention, don't get to, if you see some mistakes or things that aren't super clear in the text yet, this was an earlier version, we're still working out the text, and it'll be fully updated when we roll out the, the version of the website. This is our resources page. Currently on the community outreach SIG space on the wiki, we have community resources. It is not pretty. <laughs> We're in the process of migrating all that over to our main site here so that if anyone in the community wants to have access to videos, to white papers, to branding like all of our logos, to our slide decks, to the PowerPoint template, it's all gonna be here. It looks beautiful. And um, in version two of the website, it's actually gonna be filterable so that you can filter things by logo or by white paper, by um, newsletter, by, you know, so that it'll be easy for people to have access and find all the information you need in one space. And last but not least, this, this is my favorite page so far, I think this is our supporting partners and contributors. Now I want to point out before I go down, I think this makes our project look super legit and exciting. It's got all the list of current partners, but again, this is an older, this was our UX team was working off an older version. So if you don't see your institution, I apologize. You can come and let me know, but I have a feeling it's, it's already being added. We have a huge list and you'll see a lot. Some of the logos aren't there as well. We're doing our best. And when it rolls out, I really hope that everyone's included on the list. If not, beat down my door, yell at me, do whatever you need to do. Um, so this is what it looks like. These are our partner libraries that are currently involved in the Folio project. Like I said, so we don't have all the logos yet, but I wanted to show everyone. We're gonna be listing it in alphabetical order. And as you can see, members of Olay are also marked as well. These are all of our partner libraries. I know, it looks pretty impressive, doesn't it? I, when I looked at this page, I was like, oh my gosh, we're a huge community. These are all of our developers. Yeah, working on the project. And look at the vendors too. It's pretty exciting. The last thing that I'd like to add to this under the libraries is a section for early implementers with a list of all the libraries who are going to be early implementers. Before we did that, I, we, were, we just wanted to reach out to the early implementers. I didn't want a surprise list of them. They're like, um, So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was okay with that. And when we have a signed off list of who wants to be listed as an early implementer, that's gonna be listed on this page as well. That's all that I have for the demo, but I just wanna point out that this afternoon at 3.40, we have a full, it's called marketing update on the schedule. The community outreach SIG is gonna go into more detail about the website, talk a little bit about the process of how we got there and the timelines for the website. We're also gonna be presenting about branding, about the beautiful new B and the buzz around that, if anyone's interested to hear more information about that. And we're also gonna be presenting the full list of all the community tools and resources that we have available for everyone's use. So if anyone has any questions, feedback, or wants to learn more, please join us for our session this afternoon. I just want to say that um, marketing and the website is really critical to this project. Uh, many of you know that when we first started, uh, we, we got all jazzed up. We were talking to a lot of people. We'd point them to the website, and then it was totally confusing. People didn't know where to go. They didn't get the right information. And uh, this project is, can be so successful with, with this group and beyond, but if we don't have a good message out there and a good representation, it's gonna be hard to get the word out and, and get, uh, get more eyes on this. So 
I really want to uh, thank the EBSCO team has put a lot of resources into this to create this. It's an area that they've, uh, they've really stepped up. And uh, uh, we have a marketing team that represents the community, so we have a lot of folks on that team from this community. But the, in the back end, really, EBSCO has put a lot of resources into this, so just an acknowledgement of that. So thank you for that. Uh, Dennis. Well, I think Mark set the challenge. I'm going to do this whole presentation in four different languages. <laughs> Can you hear me okay if I leave it there? That's okay. In the interest of time, maybe I'll get started while this exciting, exciting slide deck is in the background. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in acquisitions. I'll introduce myself first. For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Dennis Bridges, and I'm the Chief Product Officer of Stacks, Inc. And our company is working on six different modules that make up sort of what we talk about as acquisitions in Folio, which is quickly expanding as well. So. Factor authentication. God bless Google. Oh boy. Just in case anyone wants to call me later. Okay, that was quick. This may be the most interesting complication I've ever had with a presentation. <laughs> Maybe I'll do this later. Okay. And then. Okay. Now I'm not going to factor that into my time, or should I? Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to talk about folio acquisitions. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not actually going to be going through uh, the live interface. I'm going to use some slides. And I would encourage you, if you want to look at it, because I do have access to our latest build of both vendors and finances with me. Come see me, and I'll walk you through it. I'd be more than happy to. Um, there is a lot of stuff in it, so I, I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. Actually, I also I want to mention this is not just a small group of people up in the Great White North working on this portion of acquisitions. Obviously, we could not do this without the engagement from our small group. Some of those folks are here. Um, and I'm very lucky to be here with two folks from our team, Kevin Horick and Arvin Andrian, two of the more public-facing members of our team. We're missing Waleed this time around, but he's coming next time for sure. Um, so if you want to talk to any of us about what I mentioned today, please feel free. What makes up these, or what are these six different modules that I'm talking about? We're talking about vendors receiving orders, invoicing, finances, and payments and credits. And we realized that uh, if you were around for RM yesterday, there are a lot of other factors affecting acquisitions that we're really focusing on today, uh, or these next few days, which are the inventory modules, 
the ERM work that is now happening, but also e-holdings. And so there's a lot of communication between our modules and other modules in the system. And a lot of the conversation that's happening here and now uh, is focused on in and around, you know, how the interaction, what are the expected behaviors between these different things. So I'll give you a quick update on what's happening with all six of these different modules in Fast Forward. This is a, a picture from the interface um, of our latest build of vendors. So we're working on getting this into the testing environment right now. And you'll notice a couple of new things here. The vendors, well, first of all, vendors has an icon. Feel free to give us your feedback on the icon when you see it in testing. Um, we've also included a set of sample data in vendors, so you'll be able to play with, when you're in there playing around, there will be vendors populated in there for you already. Um, and we're using the sort and filter component. So a lot of the newer mockups and screenshots from the system that I'm showing you today focus around not sure the best word, but trying to conform a lot of the patterns that are being used in here to things that you're finding elsewhere. And a big portion of that is using the sort and filter component in vendors and finances and in other modules that we're building orders coming up next as well. Because um, that is a common component that you see in other modules. And what does vendors do? Vendors allows you to populate information about a vendor and we're using the information you populate there uh, to help you, you know, acquire materials. So this is the orders module and slightly updated version of maybe what you've seen with respect to orders before. Again, taking advantage of the sort and filter component uh, and, and looking sort of toward the inventory module for a bit of guidance on how maybe to show this hierarchy of things that we have. Uh, because in the orders app, we have purchase orders, but we also have purchase order lines. For some of you, that doesn't make sense. For some of you, that does make sense. Um, a purchase order can have one purchase order line, and that is perfectly fine. A purchase order could also have many purchase order lines. Um, so it's really up to you how you want to take advantage, how you want to use that. But we wanted to represent it in the system in a way that is a little easier than scrolling forever and ever to find, you know, scrolling down through 100 purchase order lines. So you can see there's now a bit of a hierarchy in the lift, list there. And the, and the path towards that is uh, taking advantage of a pattern that we found in the inventory module. Now, this one changed yesterday, um, and it's probably gonna change again today, but I thought, screw it, we're gonna show it anyways. And if you wanna talk more about this, uh, what essentially shows the interaction between inventory and orders uh, but also the influence now coming from things like ERM, the ERM agreements we've talked to, we've talked about yesterday relating to orders and driving some of this functionality. Basically what happens here when we create an order, import an order, or given an order, some other application in the system makes an order, uh, we then send it, it can be electronic, it can be physical, it can actually be a mix of both. Uh, there are two different things happening, and there's an interaction with inventory, and right now, we are creating an instance of holding an item for physical things, for sure, so that we can indicate an item status, we can say that things are on order, and make sure that you're not uh, reordering something that you've already ordered recently. And if you want to influence this conversation, I think we're starting at 10 o'clock, <laughs> so be there for that. Of course, once we've made an order, we get into receiving something or checking it in. Uh, and again, vocabulary is one of, one of the hot topics, I feel like, always when we get together. But receiving, this, this screen has changed a little bit as well because we realize that when we're receiving, we also need to update things in inventory potentially for physical items. Uh, so you'll see that there's now an, a section here to add your barcode. Um, we demoed at our last development meeting that some of you may have seen a uh, little scanner app that allows you to connect your phone to your instance of folio, scan a barcode, and put that into a field. So in theory, you could potentially hit these little scan buttons and, and use that application to input barcodes into the system as you're receiving, indicate the location that this item is, is going to 
be going to, and that may already be in the order information that's pre-populating, as well as the status either could be received. Something that we've discussed is that we may want to have influence over when we're receiving something, what the status of that item should be moving forward. And I know there's item status conversation going on as well, so I don't want to say too much about that, but uh, we're thinking about those things and we're accommodating that in the interface for receiving. We've got a little screen here for check-in, which obviously relates to certain intervals of receiving, I guess, in some ways. And this is just a demonstration of how you might add a piece to this list of expected items and eventually check those things in. Invoices changing a little bit as well. Uh, again, to try and reflect this pattern of what we're seeing in the inventory module, allowing a hierarchy of things to exist in that list there because an invoice may have many invoice lines, may have 20, may have 100 invoice lines. And so rather than just seeing a vast list of accordions here, we wanted to give you a way to easily uh, target some of those specific lines uh, and interact with those things in a more streamlined way. So you're seeing that in invoicing. And invoices, as we process invoices, we generate payments. We can also manually create payments from uh, what would be a ledger record or a fund record. Uh, these payments are made against budgets, and we're gonna talk about the structure of that in a second, but this is the, an example of creating a payment manually because you are able to do that using the interface from one of these buttons here. Uh, you can make a transfer between your budgets. You could make a payment against something. And invoices will trigger these things as well. This is a fun one also. So these payments and credits, these transfers are transactions. And we wanted to give you a place where you can see all those transactions. You can sort and filter through those transactions. And I use that term because we actually turn uh, the basics of that component into a table in, in a way where you can't really see it underneath the red brick here, but there's a show hide columns. So, so this is a table in which you can add or remove columns um, based on the information that has populated the table. So if we didn't want to see expenditures or we didn't want to see the timestamp in the table, we could simply uncheck that column and it will disappear. Uh, you can also filter by clicking on the title of that, that column. So for example, transaction type, we clicked on transaction type and we can say, I want to filter this table, the, the rows in this table by payment, allocation, transfer, et cetera. And I can actually show you this one as well if you want to see it. So transactions uh, move values through the system in finances. And I won't go into too much detail about this, but we have, of course, a balance in a budget that has been allocated there uh, once allocated there, it becomes available. And as it moves through orders and all the way through to being invoiced, being paid for these things, our, our values go from being available to being encumbered to awaiting payment to being paid. And that's the end of my time. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to finish very, very quickly. So. We're talking now about finances, the finance dashboard, something that we're really excited uh, to have people start playing with uh, in the near future. And, and essentially what you're seeing here is a collection of ledgers that you may have. You can have more than one ledger in the system. In the finance module, some of you know this, some of you don't, uh, we have ledgers, funds, and budgets. So a ledger defines basically a collection of budgets are related together, or a collection of funds are related together, sorry. Uh, and all of those funds will have budgets for a fiscal year. So a ledger has a specific fiscal year period. Um, you may have different ledgers with different fiscal year periods, but they could all be the same as well. So you can select a ledger, and based on the ledger that you've selected, you will see the, the associated funds below that. Uh, and what is allocated, what is, uh, sorry, what is, yeah, allocated, unavailable, and available within those funds. This is a total of what funds relate to the budget, the ledger that you've selected, and the top is essentially the total for the system itself. So this is a dashboard that's intended to give you a very quick snapshot of where you are today financially. 
Here's an example of a fun structure that you could build in Folio. So uh, you don't need to have very hierarchical relationships in Folio. You could have a series of funds that are all, you know, have budgets that are spending money. But you could also build a structure where you have funds, and this is all within a ledger, but where we have funds that allocate money down the tree, and they eventually get to a leaf that spends money. I hope that's a decent explanation of that. So here's a, an example of a flatter structure. Uh, once we've got these structures and we're managing these things and we, we need to move into a new fiscal year, um, we've come up with this method for fiscal year rollover. And it's really, it's, it's essentially an area where you can prepare for your fiscal year rollover. So you can do stuff like check the status of orders that are outstanding very quickly from there, check the status of invoices that may be outstanding. Um, and you can also take advantage of this interface to create budgets and make adjustments to budgets all at one time. So in theory, you've got a variety of types and you want to specify what's going to happen to that type of budget as you're rolling over. And as part of that, you can adjust allocation, you can move encumbrances or not, you can move available amounts or not, uh, depending on how you manage your finances. There's also a, a button here in this area that allows you to collect or sweep budgets into one as part of preparing for this rollover so that you could spend, spend those final dollars out of one specific place. And this is just a quick snapshot of where we are uh, today. As I mentioned, we're rolling out an another update to the vendor's application that's actually in testing already. Uh, we've been working a lot on finances. This first release of the finances app that we are working on getting into testing now is a very simple version that has ledgers, funds, budgets, fiscal years, and it has the connection of all of those things together. So when you create, you're actually able to create a ledger or fund a budget, uh, update them, delete them, and so on, um, but they're also already related together. So you can say, this fund belongs to ledger A. When you look at ledger A, you will see a list of all of the funds that belong to ledger A. When you look at the fund, you'll see the ledger that it belongs to. Um, you'll see the budgets that belong to that fund. And under the budget, you, you will see the fiscal year that that budget relates to and so on. And I'll leave it there. So I look forward to seeing you all at 10 o'clock. 10.30. 10.30. <laughs>Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kalayla Gambrell. I'm the product owner for eHoldings, and I'm going to give a demo of what we did for Sprint 37. So it's not going to be the, all of what we've done for eHoldings overall, just what we did for Sprint 37. All right, so here's the team. Um, um, we got a few folks who are here um, um, at the conference. Charles, Jeffrey, Robert are here. Um, so we have a team of nine developers working on eHoldings. 
And as I mentioned, I'm just going to focus on what we did for this sprint, uh, 37. So I'm going to focus on um, creating of and editing of custom packages and editing of custom titles. So uh, there are times in which uh, you may not find the package or the title uh, in your knowledge base, and so you may want to just create that custom package and that title and have that included in your holdings and support and manage that in the eHoldings app. So now I'm going to switch gears because now I'm going to go to uh, our build here. Hopefully no one will guess the password. <laughs> so um, that, that wasn't a remark on Dennis, that was just the fact that it was a short password. Um, <laughs> So here, um, I'm on the packages a search screen here, and in the upper right hand corner, you'll see there's a new button here. And so if I need to create a new custom package, I just click new, and I have uh, the fields that I can, um, I can add a custom package. I can, I can add a pa package name, I can select the, the content type. Sorry, I feel like I'm going in and out. Um, you can see the options I have to assign uh, a package content type here and I can assign a coverage date to at, at the package level should I choose to do that. So I'm gonna actually close that out and actually search for a custom package here. Um, for those who are in the uh, uh, RM workshop, uh, this will be a familiar package that I've made custom. <laughs> so you'll see Freedom Collection here and you'll see the actual custom package detail record in the third pane. And if I choose to, I can edit the custom package, and you see I can edit the name, I can change the content type from unknown, I could make it an aggregated full text should I choose to do that. I could actually change the visibility to patrons if, if, I'm, just, if I'm making this visible to a, from a patron-facing UI to access this particular package, um, or the titles in that package, I can actually change the visibility, and I can also add, a, at a package level, the custom coverage. I can also choose to keep it selected so it's represented as a part of my holdings, or I can remove it. And if I remove it, it means it's no longer a part of my, it's no longer a part of, I can't search for it again, I can't find it again, it's completely removed from my holdings. Oh, sorry, I'm not a Mac person, so this is gonna take me a little bit of time here. Yeah, all right. Not to say anything bad about being a Mac person, it's just I'm used to my PC. All right, um, you can see that I've added a couple of titles here. Um, another one that's familiar from the workshop is the Journal of Academic Librarianship. <laughs> so I added that as a custom title. And so from here, you can see um, details about that custom title in the context of the custom package it's in. And I can actually edit that um, title in the context of the package it's in. So I can actually apply a URL. Uh, you can I can apply a URL so you can access that title in the package. I can actually apply coverage dates as well and assign a coverage statement and assign an embargo to this title that's in this package. But if I just want to update the custom title, metadata, I can just click the link that you saw on that, that record and edit the title details. So from here, I can edit the title name, add a contributor, edition, publisher, publication type. Um, I can, if I able to scroll down, I can add an identifier, ISSN, ISBN, a description and whether it's peer reviewed or not. So that's the work that the team did in Sprint 37 to support custom packages and custom titles and e-holdings. So I can skip all these slides because the build work and go to this one. So uh, since Madrid, this is what the team has done. They've done quite a bit of front end work, um, adding custom embargo, uh, sorts, filters, custom coverage, uh, 
coverage statements, uh, adding full page editing, right click support. They've also done quite a bit of back end work too, including improving our test suite and, in, and actually helping to set up a test harness for Stripes components. Work in progress as we continue to do the work for custom title, we need to provide the ability to create a custom title in the eHoldings app, um, continue to support full page editing, um, continue to work through on the provider detailed record, the ability to search within the, the packages that are tied to that provider. And uh, we'll work through mock-ups so that, similar to what Dennis had mentioned, so that uh, we need to um, be more consistent with the other folio apps. So uh, the, the design work will be to help uh, to kind of figure out how we can be more uniformed with the other folio apps. And that actually represents quite a bit of the front end work that you see here, is that work to try to be more consistent with the other uh, folio apps. And, th and that's the future work, which isn't really that much future since I got mid-May to July here. Um, but um, that's it about eHoldings. So thanks. Did I get under? <laughs> Okay, thanks. Hey, everyone. Oh, I have an echo here. Okay, I will use Dennis's trick and start the timer. So, 15 minutes from now. And then, let's see, I need to have my laptop here with notes. And then I wanted to say that here, I have a Montreal t shirt. So what I'm going to show you is what we did since Montreal. Wow. Uh, yeah, I will tell you, uh, I will show you inventory and uh, codec search. Um, it's the core team who has been developing um, uh, inventory and codec search. And I haven't listed the names, but the, the lead developers of the inventory uh, search, uh, inventory app is uh, Nils Eric. Um, from Indings Data, and it's uh, Mike Taylor who has been the lead developer of the Codex Search. And I'm Charlotte Witt with Index Data. Um, yes, that's fine. Thanks. <clears throat> um, yeah, inventory is the library's collection, and it is what the library decide to be as its uh, collection. So it can be printed resources, it can also be electronic resources, if that is um, the, the wish of the library. For inventory, we have uh, developed um, a, a specific folio uh, metadata uh, format. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and the intention is that we don't want uh, 
uh, folio to be uh, a mark centric um, system. We want it to be uh, uh, um, uh, have a be f uh, format neutral. Um, the format is uh, developed in an iterative process. We are doing it in dialogue with the um, metadata management SIG. We are doing it in dialogue with other SIGs, and the, the requirements are coming. Uh, and and um, the process we have had the um, the past month has been really interesting because I have been in dialogue now with the data migration subgroup and also with uh, the reporting SIG, and all of their requirements is kind of nicely matching up with the requirements um, the MM SIG has uh, given us um, as uh, things they needed more than just what we had in the uh, original uh, suggested list we um, had um, uh, made last summer. The records in inventory. Um, here we are using instance records for bibliographic formats, uh, holdings records, is holdings records, and then we have item records. And then we are working on a new object, the package, but yet to be defined. And uh, I hear that I was uh, missed yesterday at the RM SIG meeting, and I guess it has something to do with it. So I'm looking very much forward to join you today. <laughs> um, yes, uh, let me check. Um, ah. Also, as uh, the slide uh, Dennis showed, then just as acquisition, the acquisition apps are very much in um, uh, need to be aware of uh, where to interact with other apps in the system. The same goes for inventory, of course. Um, and inventory interacts right now with both codec search, which I, I will show you just in a few minutes, and with the Mark Cat cataloging, the new cataloging editor, um, with Dennis, with orders and other apps to come, with check in and check out, that is, all these are already established. Near future, we will, um, the inventory will interact with the authority data control um, component, uh, which later will be a, um, a mark, uh, will later be an app in its own. We uh, um, the e holdings app and the new ERIM uh, app. Oh, I'm not used to your laptop, Peter. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. Okay, I will do a demo. The inventory app is um, this brown icon here, and um, the display is the very familiar. Uh, we have this, um, yeah, when we open the app, we have the two panes, but it will be the three pane layout we have for users app for uh, yeah, um, the codex search app, etc. cetera. Uh, we, have, uh, we are using in the left pane the search and filter component, uh, right now we have um, uh, filters we um, developed for the uh, alpha uh, release, but very soon um, we are almost uh, ready with uh, resource types, uh, formats. So when we have the, um, uh, the final versions of uh, these uh, filters, then we will impl implement them and that will be Right now, it's more kind of test text we have right now. Um, you can uh, search. We have implemented uh, some search targets. 
So it's now it's possible to search on the instance ID, the title, identifier, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I will here show you a subject search. Typical, I just use title and search on Bridget, but um, not today. We have um, a type ahead uh, search uh, possibility. Um, uh, so uh, when I search my first, after my first three characters, then it um, uh, uh, yeah, then they start the search. There's also uh, added in a little delay when you uh, type, otherwise it would uh, search on A, or B, etc., and that would kill the system. Um, and I can just show you a record. Now you see an instance record in a detailed view. And this is a data set coming from uh, Harvard University Library. Um, if you are testing yourself in the uh, folio alpha, then you will feel that there's uh, uh, mostly printed resources, but that's cost of the uh, data set we have loaded here. Yesterday we had a really great session together with Kimi where the MMC were working on how to uh, um, yeah, uh, refine the display of, uh, of the instance record. You can clone the record. I will not do that now. You can edit the record and when Kimi is done with uh, refining the display of the detailed record of instance items and holdings, then we will work a little bit more on the uh, edit mode also. And you can add uh, notes to uh, your instance record also. And these, um, I will not, uh, here I clicked on the magnifier, then you get that uh, and we are skipping the search. Um, you are able to um, edit and add notes to both your holdings record and your items records too. Um, two sec. And then, I, because of this uh, record set is so new, loaded, then I need to search on Bridget. Anyway, is it all? Because she has some items record. Here we go. And here you can see we have the uh, instance record and then we have associate holdings and items records. And if you want to see a specific uh, item, then you click on the item and you get the item record with uh, also um, the availability if this item is um, available on the shelf. That was the uh, inventory. Yeah, i sorry, I didn't mention the new button, but uh, that would be just an empty template for adding a new title. Then I will uh, talk a little about the codec search. Um, codec search is um, the alpha version. And um, it was uh, a decision in Montreal that we, would, uh, we, we needed to uh, try out the concept of search across knowledge bases and uh, inventories um, because the data set are quite different. So we kind to figure out how to be able to search on uh, across data, which is kind of searching uh, across uh, apples and uh, oranges. Uh, they, they are not alike, but we need to find uh, common uh, po points where, uh, where they were alike or kind of do some mappings where we um, turn them, them in to be more alike. And also uh, developing a concept where we would be able to, because we don't know what more knowledge bases we will implement we will uh, use for the codec search. Right now we just have the EBSCO KB and we have the inventory, but we hope in the near future we will have 
many KBs and multiple inventories. Um, codec search is federated search. It uh, doesn't hold anything. There's no storage behind uh, in, in codec search. It is more a search engine searching across. Um, because uh, the stored data, they are in the eHoldings app, which uh, Kalila just uh, presented, and as it is now, and is in inventory, the one I just showed you. That was not my timeout, that was just a text, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I get so. Um, okay, and um, I know there has been, uh, there's, uh, uh, Codex Search has been um, uh, just recently user tested, and um, uh, the feedback we got was that the uh, local, what was that? And KB, what is that? So uh, we need uh, to work a bit more with our uh, terminology. And, uh, but um, for, for here, then local is the inventory app and KB is the eHoldings app. Now I will, and I haven't done this as a link, but, but I guess I, yeah, you better. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, and codec search, we have, yeah, it's, um, it's, the screen is uh, so small compared to what, how I usually see it. So, and again, very, very similar uh, layout, the frame structure, uh, the search and sort, and uh, we have filters here. But a little different from the inventory, here you can select local, and you can also select knowledge base. Uh, resource type, they are also a little bit different compared to uh, the ones I showed you in inventory, because here we have done, Kalila and I, we have done this exercise to take the resource types that is in the e-holdings and take the resource types in inventory and done a comparison and uh, try to uh, get the best out of it. <laughs> um, and so, but let me see, I can um, try and find a report and then I will search on, take, let me see to that. Okay, maybe it's, Now I just search on the title Arctic, uh, and here you can see a lot of um, the yellow or the brownish icon for uh, local for inventory, and then we have KBs, uh, the icon here. Oh, that must, <laughs> sounds almost like my uh, alarm clock, so uh, <laughs> it was not a nice feeling. But the idea is that you very um, uh, quickly get an idea about, okay, what is the source? Uh, is this the local or is it uh, coming from the KB? I better stop here. The alarm says it was over, so thank you. I'm a Mac user, I got it. All right, I guess the first thing is, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. All right, that almost never happens. I'm excited. <laughs> um, my name is Emma Betcher. I am the product owner for Loans, and today I'm just going to give you a brief demo of the state of Loans in Folio, and if there's time to talk about some of the features that are coming soon as well. Um, 
So if I go into, oh, there we go. All right, and if I go into the demo site, I'm actually going to start um, with something that Charlotte talked about over in inventory, because to check out something to a patron, I need an item to check out. And I'm going to go in, over into inventory. I hope. This. I know. Anyway, I hope this works. It was working when I practiced it this morning, but the famous last words, if anyone knows. Alrighty, okay. So I'm in to check out to the user. Um, as Charlotte was saying, if I go into the item details, there's information about an item's availability here. And this is new since Madrid. That it shows that the item status is available and the date and time when that status was applied. If there were any requests on this item, it would show that um, that is a link here if it had more than zero requests. And if this item was checked out, these fields for a borrower and loan date and due date would be relevant and populated. And we'll see that very soon. So I'm just going to copy the barcode here and bring it with me into the checkout app. Um, so since I don't have a patron standing in front of me at the circ desk, I'm just going to look someone up. Make sure that I've got an active user. And I can sort these columns um, any way I want to narrow down my search results if I was searching for it. And if I go by name, then I can just pick the top user here. And it turns out that this user is not just capable of acting as themselves, but also as a proxy for another borrower. So from here, I could uh, also charge this item to June, the sponsoring patron here. But for right now, I'm just going to continue with this current patron. So now that I've got this brought up on the screen, I've got the borrower, I can start checking out items to her. So I'll paste in my barcode here. It keeps track of how many items I've scanned during the session and also has the uh, uh, most relevant information available at a glance. The barcode and title, so I can verify that I'm checking out the item that I've meant to, and some information about the loan, the policy that's being applied, and of course the due date and time for the item. If I want to see more details about any of this, um, I can use the ellipsis menu here to get into details for the item, for the loan, and for the loan policy. So to view the item details, I can go here and you'll see that this information has now updated. So it's not, no longer available. It's been checked out. And this would link over into the loan details. <coughs> the item status date has been updated. And all these fields down here um, are linked to the borrower. And then it also has the loan date and due date for the item. I'm going to go back into the checkout. And it'll retain where I was, which is nice for the user that's multitasking. I can go here and back into the ellipsis menu to then go into the loan details uh, for this particular loan. Oh my goodness. And this is not going to be too exciting yet because, well, we just checked it out, so not much has happened to it. It's got the borrower information here and some information about the item. Down at the bottom, there's an uh, action table that shows all the actions have, that have been taken on this loan. In this case, everything that's happened is just one item in this action table that's been checked out on May 9th. It's gotten the due date here, and the status is checked out. And also records the operator that conducted that action. Going back into the checkout screen, I can also view more information about the loan policy here. If I go here, and I can open this in a new tab, And over here, you can see some of the information that's collected and applied for a loan policy. Uh, the name of this policy is 60 days, and it's named fittingly because the loan period is 60 days. And then down here, it's also got information about the grace period, whether or not it's renewable, if it's got unlimited renewals, and we'll be making use of that information uh, very quickly in this demo. 
I'm going to close out this tab and go back to the checkout screen. And now draw your attention to some information that's on the left of the screen. So there's also links to the borrower from here. So I can click on the borrower's name or their barcode to be taken to information about the borrower. You recall that when we started checking things out to her that she was a proxy for someone else and that information is reflected on the screen. And it also shows the number of loans that she has out at the moment. I can open this to see that she's got seven open loans and 20 closed loans. But if my starting place is the checkout screen, I don't actually have to go to this page just to get to her open loans. Instead, if I'm starting at checkout, I can use this link instead to get to everything the user has checked out at the moment. And sorted to the top here, because it's alphabetically first, is Al Gore and Global Warming, the book that we just checked out to this user. Um, it's a similar design pattern here with the ellipsis menu, where you can get into the item details or loan policy. Loan details isn't on this menu, but that's because this entire row is clickable to get into a loan. And I'm actually going to show you something that's slightly more exciting than the one we just checked out, which is this one that's been renewed three times, and as such, that's reflected in the action table. The due date has changed each time the loan has been renewed, and it's recording the status and the administrator that's done those actions as well. So if I want to renew the item that I just checked out to this patron, I've got a couple options. The first is that I can use the bulk action here and check off any or all of these items to renew them I'm using the renew button over here. However, I can also use that ellipsis menu, go here and renew the item for the patron. There's a little success um, toast at the bottom of the screen that tells me that I've successfully renewed the item. The renewal count increases by one and the due date, instead of being in early July, has gone up by another 60 days to early September. And then speeding up to the end of the loan, let's say that the patron has returned it. I can then check in the item to that patron by going into the check-in app. And it'd be possible to just paste it and start checking it in from here. But let's say that this patron left it in the overnight bin and I'd like to backdate the loan. I can do that by clicking in here and saying, actually, I'd like to process this as Tuesday, May 8th, instead of Wednesday, May 9th. So with that set, if I paste in my barcode here, hit enter, this item has been checked in. It shows some of the same information, the title and the barcode, the information that you need as a, at a glance. And then if I go over to the info here by the time returned, it tells me that it processed it as May 8th, even though the actual uh, day that I checked it in was May 9th. And then one last time, I can use this ellipsis menu to get into the patron details, go over into the patron's loans, and you'll see that now instead of 20 closed loans, she's got 21. And you'll also see that I've used this book for this patron many times in practicing this demo. <laughs> But if I wanted to sort and get just the specific loan that I just had, I can actually sort by loan date and sort so that the most recent loan is at the top and, so, and see all the information for this loan, again, by clicking through to see the loan details. I've only got two minutes left, so I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to go instead to show you some of the things that are coming up for loans. Um, oh, dear. All right. Um, if I go into the open loans mock-up, so the screens that you just saw, they're in no way finished, um, but some of the features that we've been working on within the loan subgroup are things like claims returned and change due date for an open loan, and some of these other features listed here in this drop-down menu. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversations we have at WolfCon to start moving those things forward. With that, I think I'm at my time, and I'm going to turn it back over to whoever is I should. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we're on schedule. It's a miracle. Um, thank you to all the presenters. I think you'll agree that we've made a lot of progress since the last time we were all together, so thank you to the teams behind that. There's a lot of work going on across the world and uh, it's great to be able to come together and give you a demonstration about where the code is, where the project is and um, 
just, it's just really exciting. Tomorrow's plenary will be doing the same thing, kind of lightning rounds on demonstrations, requests, reporting, fees, patron notices, internationalization, reserves, a whole bunch. So it's going to be um, it's going to be another interesting interesting morning. So at that with that I send you off to a great day. There are no planned events for tonight, so uh, mix and mingle and do your own thing. And we'll look forward to seeing you around and seeing you in the morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for helping out.